Good morning. Uh, I need to start with first, I am French. Okay. So you will clearly understand. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It, it was a team effort. It was a team effort. Uh, but you'll understand the night was long and sleep was quite short. So the topic, so I am with Accenture. I lead our industrial practice, uh, which is everything that has wheels. So automotive, industrial equipment, infrastructure, transportation, and also lead what we call our industry XRO practice, which is all about digital and how digital is transforming the industry, but more importantly for me, transforming the product. This is going to be the conversation I want to have. Uh, as Mark said uh, earlier, I, I'd like to start with maybe two data points, and you'll see the link with uh, Mark's presentation. Two data points coming from a survey or a piece of research we did with the World Economic Forum uh, for Davos 17. We interviewed over 2,500 executives across the world, broad set of industries. Uh, eight weeks, a piece of work, eight weeks. I remember two data points, which I thought were, wow. The first one is 80% of the executives we interviewed said that digital would completely transform their industry within the next five years. 80%. Link that to Mark, who said 73 something. 80% of the executives. But only 17% of the executives interviewed said they had a strategy to address the challenge. So if you've not started, don't worry. You're not the only ones. OK? 87% of the executives we interviewed said they had not that strategy defined. Okay? But they're convinced that digital will fundamentally transform their industry. It will change the way industrial manufacturers sell. It will change the way industrial manufacturers produce. We've seen that with Air Liquide, Air Liquide another French company. Uh, but it will also fundamentally transform the products as we know them today. So, as Allez les Bleus, I'll use a few French examples in my presentation, if you allow. Okay, so sit back and imagine that you're running a consumer goods company out of France. Okay, you'll, you'll allow me to put you back in France. So you're running a consumer goods company out of France and you've got a fleet of a thousand ten-wheel trucks spread across Europe. In the old days, you'd have to order between 30 to 33,000 tires every year for your trucks. You'd have to order those tires. You'd have to store those tires in your warehouse. You'd have to ship them, install them on your trucks. But these were the old days. Because now a company like, I'll pronounce it the American way, Michelin, a company like Michelin will guarantee you that each of your trucks has perfect sets of tires wherever the truck is located in Europe, whatever the season, important in Germany between winter and summer, whatever the haul assigned to the truck. And they will invoice you by the mile driven. So if your truck is in the depot, no mileage, no cost. And there's no obligation to put a Michelin tire on your truck. They'll even go one step further with uh, an offering they're calling Effie Fuel, and they're trying it out in several markets, both in the US and in Europe. They will commit on a reduction of your diesel consumption of 7%. That's about 2.5 liters per 100 kilometers. That's about 3,300 US dollars annual savings per truck. They save you more, they get more. They save you less, they bridge the gap. So a company which is very traditional, and they say it themselves, a 130 years old company is creating an entire new way of doing business, creating a whole new experience for their customers creating a whole new value proposition, redefining what the product is. It's not the tire anymore. It is a service, tire as a service, and it's even an outcome with Effie Fuel. They don't sell you the tire, they sell you 
the outcome. And how are they doing this? By leveraging three simple quote-unquote technologies, IoT, analytics, and mobile. So this is just one of dozens of examples of what is happening in industrial today. The future is happening now, and technology is driving the future of this industry. Established power plays and industry lines will blur. I mean, I'm sure you're all convinced and you're feeling it in your own company, in your own industry. Digital is transforming every industry. I mean, some industries have already or are already seeing the change, the ones in the upper uh, left-hand uh, quadrants, in the upper quadrants. Home and personal care products, the automotive manufacturers, uh, for example, consumer electronics. There's industries, the ones on the right-hand side of, of the chart, that might not yet be seeing the disruption, but clearly there's a huge potential of disruption. Aerospace and defense, construction, rail, and road logistics. But the key message here is that there is not one industry that will not be disrupted by the pervasiveness of digital technologies. And so here the key message is business as usual is not an option anymore. You need to move. And I thought the, the example of what Early Keed was doing was quite revealing, focusing on their operations, but also enhancing their customer uh, value proposition. You need to change. So what is, the, what is the fil rouge? What's the red thread of this transformation? It is the product. Smart and connected, the product is at the core of this transformation. And digital is reinventing the product. Products will be reinvented, I mean, from cars, to jet engines, to pumps, to heavy equipment, to medical pills. Products, machines, asset devices will communicate, will adapt to context, will exchange data via software platforms. We are entering in the era of living products. Products will become responsive collaborative, reactive, and responsible, which is one of the fourth attributes of a connected product. The product may be a B2B product, a B2C product will be completely reinvented in the near future. Products will be re-architected as hardware, the box, a simple box with basic functionality. Software, on the other hand, is becoming the connective tissue for value creation. Think of what software allows you to do. Software allows you to have, at any point in time, enhance features, automatically reconfigured. Look at Tesla, a box with a lot of software inside. Software allows you to create real-time, adaptive user experience and context. Let me share an experience, something we're doing with a, an Italian machine maker. So they make machines for the shop floor. Their next generation of machines, the one they're launching in a, uh, in a few months, will be adaptive. The machine on the shop floor recognizes, so Paul comes in, 6 a.m., it's his shift, walks in the factory, the machine recognizes Paul. The machine knows how Paul behaves. It has its profile. It knows its strength, his areas of improvement. It doesn't know that Paul was watching the football game and drank maybe too much, and so is not as alert as he was, but okay. That the machine cannot take into account. But the machine knows Paul, and the machine adapts to Paul, both in terms of the interface, but also it optimizes the team, machine plus Paul. The machine knows there's another machine, and the, Sarah's the worker. The machine of Sarah optimizes Sarah's, the team, machine B and Sarah, and then the machines optimize the two teams together. Adaptive, collaborative machines. That's not the future, it is today. 
software, connective tissue. What we are seeing, and this is what the chart uh, on the uh, depicts, is that we are also seeing a shift in value from the product, from mechanical to embedded to digital. This is where the value of the product of tomorrow lies, in the services digitally enabled. Cloud, mobile, analytics, big data, I mean, are, are becoming mainstream, and like IoT, and cheaper by the day. But if you, in your organization, felt that this was already whew, too much to harness, just wait until you see what's still in the hopper. And in the previous presentation, we looked at artificial intelligence, but you've got AR, virtual, augmented reality, machine learning, 5G networks, blockchain, quantum computing, just to name a few. So it's not industry 2.0, it's not industry 4.0, but it's industry X.0 as waves of disruptive technology continue to flow in. It's, it's just like the tide. You can't turn it. It keeps coming. So, continuous flows of disruptive technologies, transforming the product. So, you can easily understand that the products of tomorrow, they're completely different, but the way you design them, the way you engineer them, the way you manufacture them, the way you support them on the field will be also very different. In a recent, uh, recent conversation I had with uh, with Eric, who leads the, uh, the software department at Tesla. He mentioned one thing, which seems obvious, but I thought was really important and like to share with you, is that he said the Tesla models are driven by software, not hardware architecture. Software designed product. Oh, and although in a Tesla, like any vehicle, there's a lot of high-end engineering in it, but at the end, it is the software that controls the coupling of all these hardware components. Software at the core, a software-defined product. Innovation. Innovation also will change. Innovation is transformative in the new, while at the same time will continue to be incremental in the core. You'll continue to adapt incrementally your existing product portfolio. Maybe through the digital twin and getting the data from, the, uh, from your connected products, you'll be able to make these adaptations. But as you see, in the innovation space, you'll have to manage two different speeds for the new and for the core. Already difficult to manage one innovation process, but managing two at the same time becomes quite a challenge. Development. Development will be less and less predictable as we will be forced, quote unquote, to embed new and not yet mature technologies in the product. Which technology? Which solution provider should I be using? Engineering is becoming sprinted, agile, time to market, decreasing, more and more iterative. Engineering needs to open to the outside and let that innovation from partners flow into the organization. Engineering needs to ecosystem itself to be able to leverage the capabilities of partners. Why build internally what you could leverage from the outside, from a startup, for example? Time is of essence. So a fundamental change in the product, a fundamental change in the way in the product development process throughout the whole life cycle of the products. So if manufacturers are forced to reinvent their product, the question is not why anymore, it is how. And this is where artificial comes into play, artificial intelligence. AI is becoming the key technology to transform existing products into intelligent, experience-rich, value-creating products of the future.
In a piece of research we did, uh, which we released at Hanover Messer earlier this year, working with over, I think it was 500 industrial manufacturers across the world, uh, the research clearly shows that AI is at the core of these new products. 73% of the companies we surveyed, so out of the 500, said that artificial intelligence would invade and transform their products. It was 91% in the US, 96% in China, 51% in Germany. So the two, North America and Asia Pacific, leading the way and convinced that artificial intelligence would completely reinvent their products. All of the companies we surveyed said they were working on one of these AI-enabled products, and AI was at the core of these new products, but also combined with other technologies, IoT, analytics, and mobile. It is a combination of these technologies that allows to transform their products. More than half of the companies uh, we surveyed said that 30% of their revenues would be AI enabled within the next three years. More than half, 30% of their revenues. And there, there was a group that was even more bullish. Some 25% said that more than half of their revenues would be AI enabled within the next three years. Where did they come from? China, Japan, North America. Very, very bullish around artificial intelligence. So, let me share maybe what a few of our clients uh, have been doing, and, and I'll try to, I'll, I'll start with France again, and then move to the US, and then to, uh, to India. Uh, but. I'll start with a, uh, if it, sorry, let me try to get it right. Before I move, oh, right, it, it should work. Maybe I'm moving, before moving to the uh, client examples, let, let me just continue on the survey and share also something which I found, which, which I, I am seeing when working with my clients, but I thought was quite relieving, uh, revealing. More than seven, well, close to 70%, 68%. So close to 70% of, uh, of the industrial manufacturers we interviewed, so the 500, said they believed, they believe and see in AI the key enabler of their product innovation and growth strategy of the future. 70% see AI as a key enabler. But only 16% have a articulated and clear vision for their organization. And even less, 5 and 2%, have a funded and committed roadmap to making it happen. I believe, 68%. I have a clear vision, 16%. I have a funded and committed roadmap, five to two percent. So what this says is that we are here too at the beginning of this journey. So, so what, are, what are leading quote unquote companies doing? The, the five to two percent, the one that are executing, what are they doing differently? Just a few things. They focus on building data-driven business models, leveraging data. They focus on cu delivering custom, customer value, you say, yeah, but what I would say above and below the line. So defining services that will allow their customer to drive efficiencies in their operations. That's what I call below the line, but also helping their clients. This is the case of Michelin with tire as a service or FE fuel, driving efficiency in their customers' operations. But Leading companies are also focusing on above the line, helping their clients drive new revenues, new revenue growth. How can I help my customer answer the, re the demand of their own customers? Leveraging digital. 
So going one step further. It's all about ecosystems. And I think Ellie Keat also mentioned that as uh, in their ACE uh, framework, ecosystem being key. How do I leverage capabilities from others and embed them in my own organization, in my own services? It is all about redefining, adjusting the operating model from one which is focused on products to one which is focused on services. And many of these leading uh, companies take a very systematic approach to scale going beyond the proof of concept. And I think here too, Early Keat was a very vibrant example of doing this at scale. So now let me share a few examples. The first one is with Forestia, the automotive space. I mean, automotive is an industry which is being disrupted. I mean, with electrical, with autonomous, car sharing, the industry is being shaken upside down. If you look at there, there will be a massive shift in the profit from the incumbents, the OEMs and the suppliers, to the new entrants. May they be mobility service providers, completely new entrants, or infrastructure service providers. The, uh, the research we did with uh, a few of the OEMs shows that while the overall profit pool of the industry, automotive industry, will double in the next 10 to 15 years because we'll continue to sell more cars, maybe not same growth, lower, but we'll continue to sell more cars. The overall profit pool will increase, will double. The share of the OEMs and suppliers, today they capture 70% of that profit, will decrease from 70% to 35% by 2030. Where they capture 70, they'll only capture 35. And at the same time, their R&D budget will be multiplied by two or three to address electrical, to address autonomous, green mobility, and so forth. Capture less, they need to spend more in a squeeze. And it's even worse for the automotive suppliers. So Forestia and the CEO of Forestia, Patrick Collère, anticipated this and has embarked on a journey to digitally reinvent their product, which is how to leverage artificial intelligence and other digital technologies to redefine the experience in the vehicle. Because he's got a belief that tomorrow, when you, you'll want to buy or use a car, it's not going to be the powertrain that's going to make the difference. It's your, the experience in the vehicle, especially with autonomous and electrical. You have more time to spend in your car. And you will want exactly the same environment at home, in the car, in the office. Digital continuity of the consumer experience. So we've, with, uh, with Forestia, we've signed a five-year agreement partnership around co-innovation to envision, test, develop new services uh, with a focus to start with around the health and wellness uh, space. But we've also identified other value spaces which represent for Foresia a potential of between one and two billion euro incremental business by 2030. That is significant. The first project was, it was announced, the partnership was launched at uh, CES in Las Vegas this year. And the first project, uh, test project, was all around Alexa in the vehicle. You would say, well, many of the OEMs do this, so what's new? What is new here is that we developed with, I mean, Forestia, with Accenture, and Parrot and Coagent, with their uh, Chinese acquisition they made, developed a concept, and it's, it is working, it will be officially in, in, launched in production, which is an Alexa environment per person in the vehicle. You're two in a car, two Alexa environments. You're four in the car, four Alexa environment. You're seven, you can get the point. And they're all independent. The first one is around the driver still focuses on assisting and augmenting the driver. Your wife or companion sits next to you. He's got his or her own Alexa environment focused on what he or she wants to do. The kids are in the back seat. They each have their own Alexa environment. You've got four, you don't even know you're four in the car. But, but I think here the point is, you can see the 
what technology allows you to do. That was in the automotive space. Let me now go to North America with Smart Water. Small company, family owned, 300 million turnover, Boston based. If you look at energy, electricity, uh, cooling system, it is, it's a technology in commercial buildings like these, like this one, which is pretty well mastered and understood. But if you look at water, plumbing, that's still very much a black box. You'll ask the facility manager here, does he know the pressure, the flow, the temperature of the water system? No insight whatsoever. Two data points. In commercial buildings, leakage, extremely difficult to find, but it represents, it is estimated, to represent between 10 and 20% of the water consumption of a commercial building. Hotel experience, not saying that you had this. What is the third source of complaint when you're at a hotel? The shower experience. Because when you get in the shower, it's either too cold, you either get burnt, okay, because it's too hot, everybody takes their shower at seven, you get no pressure, and when you've got your soap all over, you can't turn the knob anymore, so you're there feeling stupid, full of soap. So this small company is going to reinvent the water experience. It is going to be smart and connected product, uh, plumbing, defining a completely new line of products, but also a completely new line of service. Well, they will commit on your shower, to the hotels, on your shower experience, that you will have a great shower experience, just like Michelin. But imagine what it means for them. They were ma making products. They're an engineering company. Now they need to master the whole system, leveraging technology, moving from products to services to outcomes. Last example, connected coffee in India. So this is working with a, uh, a global consumer goods company that decided to transform their vending business across India. They are making their enterprise coffee machines. They cost about 2,000 bucks each uh, for B2B businesses. They want to make these machines smart and connected. And what are they doing? They're leveraging IoT, Analytics Cloud, the three simple technologies. They're enhancing the customer experience because increasing the up, improving the uptime, but also personalization, knowing who you are, making your own coffee the way you like it, at the right temperature, with the, the milk and the sugar, or no sugar. They are targeting a double-digit growth in coffee and tea sales, while at the same time reducing significantly their operating cost. Early key example applied to simple coffee machines. So they're, and they're currently retrofitting the entire 13,000 coffee machines across India with at marginal cost. So they're bringing to the next level their uh, enterprise coffee business, they're digitally reinventing their product, their service, and they're doing this with frugality. So if you can do this in India for a coffee machine, Imagine what you could do for your assets. So these were a few examples. Now you'll say, that, that's pretty cool, but where do I get the money to do this? And working with many industrial executives, you, see, you soon come to realize that funding is a critical issue. I mean, especially in industrial. When you're a premium OEM, you're at maybe, you're single digit, you're closer to 10, you're eight, nine percent EBIT. When you're an equipment manufacturer, you're single, low, single digit, a few percent. And, and I'm sure you've seen this at your own company. How many POCs have we seen that never scale because we're all convinced, but we don't have the money to do it. So working with, uh, with many of our clients, 
in different segments, we looked at and identified that there is still a lot of value trapped in the enterprise and that technology such as IoT, analytics, and cloud, the three I keep hitting on, are the right levers to pull to unlock this value. It was not, could not do it before, but now with these technologies, this is something you can do, even in the automotive space. I work closely with one of a, a global OEM. They said, we squeezed everything out of manufacturing. There's still a lot of value trapped in manufacturing on the shop floor, which can be unlocked through this, uh, these technologies. The work we've done, and it's not research, but the work we've done with the OEMs, with electrical equipment manufacturers like Emerson, Schneider, and a few others, or in the consumer product space, we have proven that there is between 300 and 700 basis points of incremental EBIT to unlock. 300 to 700 basis points. I mean, that is worth looking at and going after. And 70 to 80% of this value lies in digitizing your customer interaction with your customers and digitizing your operations. It's not about new business models yet. It will come. It's not about these new services. It's all in the four walls of the enterprise. So transforming your core operations to unlock value, which will then allow you to fuel growth in your core business, but also experiment the new that's what we should all be doing. That is what we, as remember, business as usual is not an option. This is what we should go after. The value trapped in the enterprise, digital. A few things. On wrapping up, I'd like to leave you with, so this is a journey. It's, it's not going to happen like this. There's six things to focus on. The first one is transforming your core operation, leveraging digital technologies, integrating end-to-end -end the product, what I call the product value chain, engineering, manufacturing, after sales, the digital twin, the digital thread, but also leveraging artificial intelligence or analytics on the shop floor, driving the value, which is still locked in the enterprise. One, that will help you if I move to four, then fund the new, new business models. Try this out. Why is Michelin that manufactures tires setting up a specific division selling services with no obligation to use Michelin tires? Trying out these new business models to understand the impact and how the core organization reacts. Two, focus on experiences and outcome. The move from products to services to outcome. We're in the service economy. That's already maybe behind us. We're moving towards an outcome economy. It is about experience. As the head, let's say, the executive team of Neo out of China, what is driving? How are they designing their new vehicle? It is experience driven. It's not engineering driven. It's not software driven. It is experience driven. Experience beats features. Ecosystem, I think uh, what we saw this morning, uh, I think that is, that's a clear message. L let that, one minute, let that innovation flow into the organization. Leverage partner capabilities. Do not reinvent what others have done. Bring it into agility. Sport. Build the workforce. Never forget the men and women of the enterprise. How do you help them? There's new roles. When I saw the LE Kid with her 2,200 models, who's going to take care of those algorithms? The algorithm shepherd. But think about the impact on the workforce on the shop floor. A bit of thinking to be done and uh, change management. And manage the pivot wisely. There's not one pivot to the new. There's multiple pivot. Pivot of the product agenda, Pivot in your business models, pivot in your workforce. That needs to be managed. So I, I hope I got the message across that this is a, a very important rotation for industrial companies. And I'd like to leave you with two resources. 
So the first one is a pretty good book, Industry X.0, Realizing Digital Value in Industrial Sectors. I know the author. He's an okay guy. I mean, that's, that was me. Yeah. Uh, a bit of content. It's not a strategy book, honestly. It's, it's pretty pragmatic. Um, you can flip through the chapters. There's good case studies. Uh, it was written with uh, many of our clients. Uh, it's on Amazon. I'm proud to say that it was number one for 10 weeks in Japan, the Japanese version. So uh, first time I, I was number one in Japan, that, that was a, uh, and it's selling well in China. So that, and the second book, which I honestly also would highly recommend is Human Plus Mind, Plus Machine, sorry, H Plus M, from uh, Paul Dargerty, who's our Chief Technology and uh, Information Officer. It's all about how to leverage artificial intelligence, working with over 1,500 companies. Here too, very, very pragmatic. How do I leverage artificial intelligence in R&D, in manufacturing? Uh, good case examples. So I'll leave you with, uh, with these two resources. Uh, which uh, you can order on. I get a buck. I get a dollar for each book you buy. No, just kidding. But uh, honestly, the two are very good. And I wanted to thank you for listening. And I, I guess we're going break.